explores the um, addition of bevacizumab to the primary treatment of patients with newly diagnosed glioblastoma. This is the most common type of primary brain tumor. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Patel, and I'd like to thank the uh, ASCO Program Committee for this uh, great honor and the ability to present uh, before you on behalf of my colleagues. So this is the RTOG0825 study, which is a phase three double-blind placebo control trial uh, looking at the addition of bevacizumab to the standard of care for patients with newly diagnosed glioblastoma. Uh, glioblastoma, as you've heard, is the most common malignant primary brain tumor. Um, the current standard therapy is maximal surgical resection followed by a combination of uh, radiation with temozolomide chemotherapy followed by six to 12 months of temozolomide chemotherapy. But even with this, the, the average survival remains less than 18 months, so there's clearly an unmet need. What is one of the most prominent features of glioblastoma is angiogenesis. And we heard from Dr. Tawari that angiogenesis is the way that tumors uh, allow themselves to grow beyond just a few millimeters and a very prominent feature in, in brain tumors. And as you can see on this MRI scan, after delivery of a contrast material, you see it extravasate out of the newly formed blood vessels into the surrounding tissue, and that's why we see contrast enhancement. And when our pathologists look at uh, tumor tissue, they see these large areas of these very tortuous vessels, a hallmark of angiogenesis. Since it's such a prominent feature of glioblastoma, it seems a very logical target, and it turns out that the most prominent factor is VEGF-A, and it turns out that bevacizumab specifically targets VEGF-A, so it seemed like a very logical connection. And so initially, there were studies done in patients who had recurrent glioblastoma, so they had gone through the first line of treatment and underwent therapy with, with bevacizumab, and some of the responses were, in fact, quite dramatic. There were two uh, clinical trials done in recurrent disease looking at bevacizumab as a single agent, and both of these showed very promising clinical response, which led to the accelerated approval of bevacizumab for patients with uh, recurrent glioblastoma. Well, of course, there's then interest in seeing if this would um, work even better in patients with newly diagnosed disease, and that led to the RTOG0825. As I mentioned, it's a placebo-controlled, double-blinded study. It is a collaborative effort, not only uh, the Radiation Therapy Oncology Group, of which I'm a member, but also the North Central Cancer Treatment Group and the Eastern Cooperative Oncology Group. It's an interesting statistical design, as we included two primary endpoints, progression-free survival and overall survival. And one of the important statistical uh, features is that when you do that, you need to actually take the overall statistical significance, the p-value, and split it between the two arms. So you take the classical p-value of 0 0.05 and need to give part of the p to progression-free survival and part of the p to overall survival. And we decided prior to the initiation of the study that we would weight it more towards overall survival. So you see the p-value we were trying to achieve for overall survival was 0 0.046 and for progression-free survival, 0 0.004 added together, 0 0.05. What's also important about this study is that we mandated that all patients provide tumor tissue because we were going to use molecular factors for stratification, which provided us opportunity for better uh, division of the patients, but also the opportunity to do some advanced molecular testing. And we incorporated into this trial a battery of testing looking at patient outcomes patient performance measures, and these included symptom burden, neurocognitive function, and health-related quality of life. On the bottom, you see the schema. Patients, all patients underwent radiation chemotherapy for three weeks and then were randomized to receive their remaining three weeks of chemoradiation either with placebo or with bevacizumab, and then they followed with up to 12 months of either temozolomide, the chemotherapy with placebo, or temozolomide with bevacizumab. The other very important feature is at the time of tumor progression, we broke the blind. So we were able to tell the patient and their treating physician what they had been treated with, and then the patients had the opportunity to either cross over, if they had been on placebo, to a bevacizumab-containing regimen, or 
they can continue bevacizumab um, either on the same regimen, but typically an alt alternate regimen. Here are the overall results of the study. You see on the left-hand side the survival curve. The median survival for placebo was 16.1 months. The bevacizumab arm was 15.7 months, and it did not achieve statistical difference, the p-value being 0.21. For progression-free survival, there was prolongation with the bevacizumab at 10.7 months and placebo at 7.3 months. Even though the p-value was 0 0.007, it did not reach our predetermined level uh, of uh, success. So the patient population, just to put in perspective, we randomized 637 patients, so a very large study. Um, the stratification and the balance between the two arms was uh, outstanding. All patients did provide tumor tissue, and we had more than 80 percent of the patients volunteer to participate in the net clinical benefits part looking at quality of life, symptom burden, and neurocognitive function. As Dr. Tawari mentioned, there are adverse events associated with bevacizumab, but overall this treatment was well tolerated. However, there were, as expected, uh, more side effects with bevacizumab looking at hypertension, the development of either deep venous thrombosis or pulmonary embolus, wound healing issues, gastrointestinal or visceral perforation, hemorrhage, although that's quite slight, and then um, some increase in, in problems with uh, neutropenia. I'm missing a slide. Um, the first line, bevacizumab, um, as I mentioned, did not improve overall survival for patients with glioblastoma. The progression-free survival uh, was longer but did not reach the specified, uh, study specified target. Um, the slide that had the data showing symptom burden or neurocognitive function and quality of life data, unfortunately, um, was not here, but it did show an overall decline over time on the patients uh, on the bevacizumab arm. And so in conclusion, uh, we feel that bevacizumab remains an important therapy for our patients with glioblastoma, uh, but the results of this study do not support its frontline use. Rather, it can be reserved as a later treatment. Thank you very much for your attention.